Look, I understood that I had the required training, that age wasn't a factor. Before we chat, I'm obliged by law to inform you that I am an AI company representative. I, however, hold senior management equivalency. If that makes you uncomfortable, I can ask a colleague to schedule a call with you. I don't understand. I was ranked very highly for this job. Unfortunately, the roles you're rated for reached obsolescence sooner than anticipated. Would you like me to put you through to one of our counselors? That was a clip of Lisedi back when she was still only 120. And that's what it's like to be told the career you just retrained in has been taken over by artificial intelligence. Earning an income when you're well into your second century is complicated. I'm Sam Gwenya, and this is The 200-Year-Old. Scientists predict that the first person to live to 200 may have already been born. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. As Sunlam turns 100 this year, they are looking ahead at what fundamental changes might take place in the world so that we can plan better for the future. This is Dr. Aubrey de Grey, the Chief Science Officer of SENS Research Foundation in 2018, talking about the impact of extending life. The economic impact will be just like, there's no way to describe it. The whole way that the world works will be really, you know, qualitatively different than how it is now. If you think about the major decisions that the man in the street makes in terms of spending over their life, then they're all predicated upon the kind of track, life track that we see today, of a certain predictable amount of health followed by a predictable amount of ill health followed by death. You know, whether it's to do with insurance, life insurance, health insurance, pensions, inheritance, even education, all of these things <coughs> will have to be completely rethought. And of course, when I say have to, I mean it's going to be a very good thing that we can rethink these things, but the fact is, yes, it's going to be profound. Sam, you know you asked me to look at Lissetti's financial records. I've got stuck on something. We are at my home, and this is Anne, my assistant and producer. She'd probably host this podcast if I let her. Do you want the technical stuff or just the top line? I've learned the hard way not to ask Anne for the technical stuff. <laughs> I can follow Lissetti's records till about 40 years ago, so I have noted periods of high income and high savings. Yes, what else? Then I noted periods where her savings and investments start to get depleted. Still, nothing surprising here yet. But then there's 10% of Lissetti's life where she was earning a tiny income. She didn't draw much from her savings here and didn't spend very much either. So we can assume that her lifestyle was very basic and she was having a quiet kind of semi-retirement. So then what's the problem? Well, um, to put it non-technically, she should have been completely broke 30 years ago. Like, completely. Skint. El Cheapo. In the red. Sleeping on a park bench. I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay, fine. That is interesting. Did you ask about those last 30 years? Yes, and how's this? Her assistant wouldn't tell me. No response. Rude, huh? You don't think she was, uh, you know, doing something, something, you know, side hustle, you know, something shady? Do I think the world's first 200-year-old has an illicit income? No, Anne, I don't. Anyway, she's far too high profile to get away with that. Please pause on this for now. Gotcha. I should mention, Anne is my AI assistant. She has a flair for the dramatic. Completely my fault. <laughs> That's the AI profile I chose. I'm inside another one of Lissetti's virtual spaces. It's 2042. I asked her to choose places for our meetings that are important in her life. I'm outside the HR office where newly graduated interns wait to get inducted here at Barrow Gwanath Hospital. This is where Lissetti worked in her first career as a doctor and then later on as an oncology specialist. We haven't spoken since she cut our last conversation short. All I had was a request to meet her here. Hello, Sam. You left so suddenly. You know, I thought maybe you wouldn't come. Oh, there's no need to worry, Dana. I did agree to do this and I will do it. 
Can we talk about what you said at the end of our last conversation before you left? Oh, Sam, I don't want to talk about that right now. That's okay with you. What else did you want to talk about? I'm fine, really. Um, okay. Right, so um, we're in the hospital where you started your first career. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels like a good place to talk around two things that are very connected. One is work, one is money. You know, some of the biggest changes and problems have been caused by these two things during your lifetime. Yeah. But as you said, you weren't aware that you were going to live so long until you reached your late 50s, of course. Mm -hmm. So what did you think would happen with your career before that? Well, the same as everyone else, really. My plan was to stay in medicine for a while, mm -hmm. then stop running around the wards and take a desk job. And then retired my 60s after hopefully saving enough money, which was the norm back then. And here's where things start to get complicated. The economy of the early 21st century was built around working for a certain period of time during which people hopefully saved and then they retired. That was it. This is Anton Kildenes, the chief actuary and group risk officer of Sunlam back in 2018, considering why the idea of longevity back then scared the world so much. I think the important thing is we don't know what will happen. Um, sure, there are a number of trends indicating that people might live much longer, um, but you're entering totally uncharted territory. You know, if you start talking about people living 120, 130, we've never had that before. But if you live to 200, I mean, no amount of saving will be able to carry you through that, so you will have to quadruple your working time. There's not quadruple amount of work available. So what does that mean? To what degree will we be more dependent on the state? You know, if, will there be a state? Extending life beyond its natural limits is one of the worst disasters the human race has inflicted on itself. It's up there with nuclear weapons and global warming. This is an important voice in our story. Her name is Tebi Sandaba, and she's talking back in 2118. Lisetti was around 100 at this point, but biologically only in her early 40s. Tebisa was a writer, an activist, and one of the strongest voices arguing against life extension at the time. It's the ultimate act of selfishness. As one generation extends its life indefinitely, the next generation suffer. Artificial intelligence, automation, all these things supposedly making our lives better. Jobs are already scarce. Just as this hits us, we also have older generations fighting younger ones for whatever work and resources are left. But Tebisa wasn't just a leading voice in the movement questioning life extension at the time. She was also Lisedi's youngest child from her first marriage. Look, every family has its dramas, but it doesn't get more divisive than one generation wishing the next one dead. Tebisa always argued that she could love her mother, but not love what she represented. I assume Lisedi still finds their very public conflict deeply painful. This was a hundred years ago, remember? And at the time, the problems caused by huge changes in technology, longevity and climate change caused worldwide financial turmoil. Here's Anton Kildenes from Sunlam on the financial impact of longevity. To the degree that people live longer, pension funds, the role that pension funds will have will change. Um, and there are a couple of scenarios. The one scenario, which would clearly be the one that we would prefer, is that people recognize that they need to save more, they need to save longer, and they need to preserve their wealth. And the consequence of that would be that pension funds would grow much more, and they will become much bigger, which would mean that there's more capital available in society. And that capital then can be put to use, and that will create jobs and so on. So you get a, a virtuous circle. The converse could be that people believe that they will be productive for the rest of their lives. There's no need to save for retirement anymore because retirement is dead. Um, so that discipline disappears completely. And it could even be that it's forced to disappear where people simply don't have the level of income. In such an environment, capital accumulation would reduce, which would mean less capital is available, which would mean, again, less jobs, which means less savings, and that's a vicious cycle. Even back in 2018, they recognized that life expectancy changes of even a decade or two could have a profound impact on our economy. But what happens when our life expectancy is impossible to predict? 
then how do you structure your life? Well, I think we have to hear from Lisedi herself on this since she has lived through it all. Living longer means you had to plan for a completely different life. You, know, you said last time we spoke that you couldn't afford to just retire and you didn't want to either. Not indefinitely. Mm. So, how did you do it? Mm. Sam, take a tip from a very old woman. Mm. Make sure that you take a retirement at least every 30 to 40 years. Relax, travel, visit with family. But don't take any one retirement for too long. Look, you have to find something new to work on or you'll get left behind very quickly. So you've never retired like people used to in the olden days? How could I? <laughs> Look, if you know you're going to live a long time but don't know how long, you have no idea how much you need to save. So even in this cyclical life, you need to plan ahead. So what you're saying is money may be different now than what it was 200 years ago, but the fundamentals are still the same. That's exactly it. So the big difference, if we're all going to live longer, is this switch from a linear way of life to a cyclical way of living. And Lisedi was amongst the first to make this shift, not realizing it would have some unintended human consequences. So tell me, why are you so opposed? Before all this, generations worked in partnership. All the generations would pass on knowledge, and if they had money, their financial resources to the next generation. They would help raise children to take the pressure off... This is Tabisa appearing money, as a guest on a popular talk resources. show. She became almost as famous as her age-defying mother. Human beings are around today because of this generational partnership. That's how we survived and thrived. That partnership is broken now. The flow of resources and space to live from one generation to the next is gone. And now that much older generations remain younger mentally and physically, they keep a hold on top-tier jobs in all industries, leaving younger generations with much narrower opportunities for professional success. So in the future, what's stopping them giving up on competing altogether? Then what? Well, half of us have to leave the planet. Is this going to end in conflict between the old and the young? Remember, Tebisa was living a hundred years ago, during the Great Transition, a time of uncertainty and financial turmoil when the economy had to be completely reinvented. In the 21st century, we spent a vast amount of the world's wealth caring for the aging. But we realized that if fewer people suffered the diseases of old age, or didn't even get old or sick in the first place, that money could go to other things, like creating opportunities for younger generations. The phenomenon came to be known as the longevity dividend, which is the benefit society gains from a slower aging population. It started with a decreased burden of welfare costs and began to trickle into all aspects of the economy. Dr. Aubrey de Grey in 2018 again. I think when people worry about and try to think about a society that is post-aging, where we just don't have these problems of uh, ill health associated with old age anymore, then usually the mistake that they make, in fact, the hugely, overwhelmingly ubiquitous mistake that is made, is to presume that everything else is going to be more or less the same as it is today. There will be a huge shift in the direct costs of medicine from the cost today of trying to actually eliminate the ill health of old age, which is a consequence of being alive and therefore is not capable of being eliminated directly, a shift in favour of preventative medicine, preventative maintenance, that gets rid of the precursors of those pathologies, the damage that accumulates throughout life. That will mean that people don't get sick. It will mean that the costs are considerably less, simply because prevention is always better than cure, but the savings that we will get from this shift in where the money goes, the medical money, will actually be dwarfed by the indirect savings in terms of societal prosperity arising from having the chronologically elderly being still able-bodied. I'm back with Lisedi in the hospital. Coco Lisedi, in the early days of anti-aging, there was a lot of concern about who would have access to these therapies because, of course, the costs were too high to start with. There was a real danger. It became something only for the rich. Mm. 
Mm. Well, I was in a different situation than most. I was a doctor working for the state, and I was one of the early successes from the trials. And so I wasn't paying for the treatments. But if I had wanted to get it commercially, no, I definitely would not have been able to afford it. That's one of the reasons my first husband, Lucia, couldn't do it. Fortunately, in a democracy, you get to vote for what you want. And people wanted easy access to these therapies. Okay, so you didn't have to pay for these therapies. But as you grew older and a generation came behind you that was also going to live longer, you saw how the world changed as a result, mm. particularly from an economic sense. Yep. Now, Coco, what are the biggest economic changes you've seen from the world you grew up in to the world now? I think one of the biggest changes is how we use money. When I was young, money was often seen as a measure of success. People spent it on things they didn't need to appear successful. Of course, those who spent frivolously then no longer had money left for the things that they would really need. You can't think that way if you're living so long. You need to see money as a tool, not a social scoring system. And of course, beyond how currency has changed, even the idea of how we get it has changed too, right? Absolutely. There's been a massive shift, and we didn't have a choice. Look, after the economic crash about a hundred years ago, mm -hmm. the whole idea of money, of work, of putting all our eggs in one basket with a single economic system, well, that had to change. My name is Gavin Marshall. Um, for the last two years, I've spent most of my time exploring blockchain technology. My, my, my intent around this is really to try and understand money and how we interact as human beings around money. So there's, there's a shift that is happening already. Um, and, and I think that there's going to be this sort of uncomfortable middle where we're trying to figure out what work means. So there are a lot of experiments that are being done around universal basic income. Um, you know, do we need to be working for money? Um, you know, surely just being a human being should qualify me to at least get some kind of, of, of um, sustenance. Before the crash, money was linked very much to a job. You did a job and you got a salary. And if you didn't get a salary, you were in trouble. But with technology replacing the needs for humans in many jobs, a different idea of work and money started to appear. So one of the biggest changes for Lucetti in terms of money was the rise of social currency. She would take on a project and receive social credit for it. Lucetti would decide on a need to solve and the social currency system attached a value to it. She could do that project for a few days or for a century. So at one point, when she was baking bread, she would only get a few social credits. More as the bread got better. But on top of that, Lisetti got ongoing credits for taking part in the longevity trials. And that went on for centuries. Sometimes she worked by herself, sometimes as part of a team. And I guess that's the closest we still have to a company these days. So the biggest shift was away from money only based in things like property or gold and the shift into currency based on people and their time, ability and imagination. So, so I think a system of social credits would be a good start. You know, I, I think any of these things would be sort of an intermediate step to getting somewhere, somewhere else that, uh, you know, we, we can't really picture yet because we're so embedded in the current system. Um, I think the bottom line of it all is realizing that, you know, money isn't the thing we need. Money is the thing that we use to negotiate with each other because actually what we need is each other. And, 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 and money has been the technology that we've used to negotiate those relationships that we have with each other. It's just become the focus. And we've, we've forgotten that what we actually need is each other. And, and so I think systems of social credits and so on can, can realign us a little. And, and yeah, there have been a number of experiments, you know, looking at social impact tokens or, um, you know, ways that I can measure my, uh, my impact on the world. I think that we can innovate um, in all sorts of ways. And I think part of what our innovation around tokens and, and, and things will do is to maybe increase our awareness. You know, things like uh, carbon credits, for instance, has made us more aware of our impact on the environment. 
If only Kabisa had been around to see and understand that, I think she would have loved it and she would have worried a lot less about the future. But there's still a missing piece for me. Um, Coco, I, I have to ask you an awkward question. Fire away. <laughs> Samuel, I'm almost 200. I'm a big girl. Right, so um, according to your archives, you know, the last recorded income I can find was when you were 160. And by my calculations, there's no way that would have seen you through to your last 40 years of retirement. Do you mind if I ask you how you funded your life since then? Oh, so you and your oh-so-curious assistant haven't guessed it yet, huh? No, sh should we have? I am the world's uh, oldest living person. Tell me now, what is the one thing that I have that's more valuable than anything else? My biological data. Lifetime rights. I won't tell you how much, but let's just say it's close to invaluable. I invested what they paid me wisely, and that helped me make it last. It's certainly more than enough to cover my expenses. I'm surprised that you're such a private person. You I... only do what you have to do. One day when you are 200 and beyond, you'll see. Speaking of which, you know, that there's something I wanted to bounce off you, you know. One mm -hmm. of the reasons I decided to get into this project is because I'm personally grappling with taking anti-aging therapies myself. Mm. You know, I thought I'd have a better handle on what I want to do. You know, in my mind, it would give me so many more opportunities. You know, time to watch my kids and their kids and watch them all grow up. But I have to be honest. After our chats, it doesn't always sound like sunshine and roses. Oh, I'm done now. I, I can't advise you either way. I'm not sure what I would decide if I were to go back and do it all over again. Look, Coco, Lucidi, I... Can I come talk to you in person? Mm -mm. I, I, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to visit you in your memory archives, but it... Mm -mm. Just, just some, hear me out. Some things are better discussed in reality. That is not a good idea, Mdana. Mm -mm. There is no point to you coming all the way here to see me. It's not necessary. I'll tell you everything you need to know right here. I'm suspicious. Why the reluctance to meet with me in real life? I feel like it goes beyond her apprehension of the media or the protection of her privacy. I, I think she's hiding something. Maybe she's worried that whatever I find out will affect my own decision. I really need to find her. In the next episode of The 200-Year-Old, what will marriages of the future look like? Marrying someone where you can both live so much longer, just, it has to follow different guidelines. Will there be any jobs left that aren't done by AIs? The term artificial intelligence is actually quite misguided. And a lot of researchers are starting to recognize that. Um, for me, it's really, the, these are very powerful tools. And what about the workplace? Just imagine trying to do business with people seven or eight generations younger. I don't think it's going to be so easy. And the biggest mystery of them all, what is Coco Lisedi hiding from me? Plus, I meet a surprise visitor in a strange cabin, and he might just have some of the answers we're looking for. This podcast is brought to you by Sunlum. To subscribe, visit www.the200yearold.co.za. Everything you hear in this podcast is based on current science and future forecasts by leading experts. To find out more about the research that went into this episode, ask the 200-year-old a question on Twitter at 200-year-old. That's at 200-year-old. If you like this episode, please rate it and leave a review on your podcast platform.